the, the, the thing that was important to me right from the very outset was that um, I had to do something that was sustainable. Okay, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And today we're joined by Mark Beddo. Um, how are you doing, Mark? I'm absolutely fantastic, thank you. The sun has been shining today and I've had a good day, so everything's good. That's great. Um, so, Mark, you know, obviously you and I have known each other for a while, so I, I know a lot of your story. Um, but for people that are joining us and watching this who maybe don't know anything about you, could you just give us a little bit of background on yourself um, and then you know, we'll pick up on the specifics of kind of like your aha moment and you know, how you came to sort of empower your own life. But if you can just give us a backstory of um, you know, maybe to introduce some people to um, you know, the challenges and things you were facing before that happened. Okay. Um, well, let's, uh, I'm going to take you back 20 odd years, I think. That's probably a good place to start. Um, and uh, around that time I got married. Um, so I, I have a fantastic wife, her name is Carolyn, and we have three daughters. And around that sort of uh, time, we didn't have three daughters when I got married, by the way. <laughs> uh, but our first daughter came along uh, sort of about 12 months later. And um, I think really that was the beginning of my downfall, if you see what I mean. Um, because then I suddenly had to grow up in my mid-twenties and I had responsibilities and uh, uh, a wife and a child and a mortgage and all those things. And I just started to work as hard as I knew how to. Um, to support them, to provide the best family uh, that I could, uh, family life that I could. Um, and in doing that, um, it's very easy to start neglecting yourself because your focus is on, on other people. Um, and I think over, the, over that period of sort of certainly 15 years, uh, my weight started to, uh, to increase um, uh, quite substantially. Uh, and at its worst, I was um, something in the region of sort of 318 pounds or sort of 20, well over 22 and a half stone uh, or 144 kilograms. Uh, for anybody else that's, uh, that's interested. Um, and, uh, and that had just come through pure neglect. So I was working extremely long hours in a very stressful environment and, uh, uh, and uh, not eating well, doing lots of driving. Neil appreciates this because he had a very similar existence where we were living out of service stations and, and hotel restaurants for, uh, for a lot of the time. Um, and, and really my health deteriorated and my weight ballooned um, and, um, and and that was my life for um, uh, a sort of a good sort of 15, uh, 15 years or so. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, I managed to sort of reverse that um, about uh, or start to reverse that about uh, uh, 20 months ago. Um, and I still have the wife and children. So I, in, in sort of uh, trying to put a bit more focus on me, I haven't lost the importance of the family that I've got around me as well, which, uh, which has been fantastic. So I'm now a 48-year-old man who's uh, slowly revitalizing his health and, uh, and uh, is very grateful for it as well. That's great. So, I mean, um, Sue, you, do you, have you got, obviously, you, you know less of Mark's story than me. So from what he's just shared there, is there anything specific that jumps into your mind as questions? Yeah, uh, first question, Mark, is, you know, you said 20 months ago was kind of like the, the start. What, what was your um, initial motivation to make that change? You know, was it literally like a lot of other people where you get to a point and you're like, something has to change here? Or was, did some, what kick-started you on that journey? It was um, the, the, the sort of the real trigger uh, happened um, a couple of years, uh, well, several years before that, actually. Um, I was in a sort of um, a position where I was, I was working very long hours and, and sort of uh, not taking great care of myself. Um, and, and it was about in 2007, I think, so going back a fair while, um, I was diagnosed with a condition called um, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, which is a, effectively a, a condition um, which can be life-threatening um, and it, effectively what happens is when I'm asleep I stop breathing mm -hmm. um, and, um, and that can cause all sorts of uh, complications. Um, so that was really the first, the first thing, that was sort of quite a dramatic uh, impact on, on my health. Um, I mean, Mark, that's a really, you know, obviously it's a really scary thing. How did you discover you had it? 
Um, I I think I knew that I, so I had a problem, but I was in denial for a, for a good while. Um, and it was actually my wife that um, said to me at, at some point, "Do you know that you?" That you stop breathing when you're uh, when you're asleep, and and in fact, she used to uh, it used to impact on her uh, rest as well because she used to stay awake waiting for me to stop breathing so that mm -hmm. she could give me a nudge to start me breathing again. Um, so it was really uh, really my wife that sort of uh, highlighted the uh, the problem, but I was suffering dreadfully with um, you know uh, really uh, bad daytime sleepiness, so I I could fall asleep. Um, mid conversation with people, I, I couldn't watch television for more than sort of ten or fifteen minutes without falling asleep. Um, you know, it was uh, it was uh, it was quite bad, and there were sort of another of uh, a number of other um, um, symptoms as well, which are sort of uh, quite unpleasant, which are related. So I think we knew for a while, and I was in denial for a while as well. But it, eventually, I had to uh, I had to go and try and get it uh, sorted out. Do you think, Mark, it was um, initially, you know, a contributing factor was the fact that your energy levels must have been so low, you know, you'd almost got to burn out and, and that might have um, brought on the condition in, in a way, you know? Um, I, it's, it's possible. I mean, I, I think probably the, the biggest contributing factor to, to obstructive sleep apnea is um, obesity. Yeah, the weight. So I was, uh, I was sort of, you know... Um, very overweight at that point and um, you know the, I, I suspect that an element of it may be genetic because I'm convinced that there are other family members that have suffered um, in the past um, but uh, certainly my, my weight gain wasn't really helping the situation at all so uh, that's probably the, the primary um, contributing factor I think. So at that point Mark did you had you heard about juicing, you know, or was it a case that you went on a, a discovery journey then to find, you know, which route would help that condition? No, again, it was, um, this was in 2007, so I, I, I sort of... <laughs> I'm intrigued to know <laughs> why Neil is laughing. I know, I know what's coming, that's what. <laughs> um, I mean, the, um, no, I didn't, I didn't really know about juicing at all. Um, and I kind of, um, the, my symptoms were being managed and taken care of. So I kind of got straight back into the work hard in, in my existing sort of um, occupation routine. Um, and so it was, it was about 12 months later that um, I had another sort of step back with my health. And that was, um, I was um, uh, diagnosed with uh, stress. So I was laid off work for uh, for a while with um, with stress, and so you know that was another sort of significant uh, trigger point, and at, it was at that time that I knew that I had to do something about my lifestyle, and I thought the solution was going to be change my job, so find a job that was less stressful, involved less travel, uh, allowed me to be at home more often. Um, you know that I could sort of probably eat regular meals with my family, and and, and I thought that was going to be the answer, um, and it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't the answer at all. It it took me a couple of years actually to sort of from that point to actually find a job that um, and that I was uh, that I was happy to um, to take on as well. Mm -hmm. So you know none of this happened overnight. It, it took you know years for me to um, uh, to get to the point and um, so we're at the point of two, the year about 2000 now um, and it was um, about six to twelve months before that point where Neil actually joined the same company that I was working for. So, so two, okay. 2008, 2009, yeah. Was it, was it, was it that late? Yeah, it was... It, I, that long ago? It was, it was 2009 that I, that okay. I joined that company. I mean, Mark, <coughs> just for background for people, Mark and I used to uh, collaborate on some stuff when we were working in different companies. So, I mean, I think, I think we probably first met each other, Mark, back in what? 2005, 2006, something like that. Yeah. There was, there, there was definitely a good two or three years that we knew each other before we were working in the same company. Um, and I mean, the, the reason I was laughing when Sue was asking those questions and she was, you know, thinking, what is it with Neil? Why, why has he got this big smile on his face? What's Mark about to say? 
I, I was expecting you to maybe start talking about, you know, the um, the fact you were working with this other sort of obese guy who then suddenly started ordering all kinds of weird shit in restaurants. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm assuming I'm allowed to use that word because you know this is this is um, you know yeah this this is this is for an audience who are. Well, you mean the word weird, Neil? Audience. No, I mean the odd expression, <laughs> no. you know. So, um, but you know, yeah. So that's, I guess that's the next part of your your story is where it overlaps with mine. There, Mark, isn't it? Is in that period we were working together, and you know, we'd go out for meals because we were staying in hotels. I mean, I don't know what your mileage was like at its heaviest, but I know mine when I was on the road. You know, I had one point where I put 36,000 miles onto a new company car in six months. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, that I'm not saying that was typical and I did that every year, but I was probably averaging sort of somewhere in the region of thirty to 50,000 miles a year, every year for, you know, 10 years of my life or longer. Yeah. Um, living out of suitcases, stuff like that. And, and your existence was very similar, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. I, th I was doing thirty, 30 to forty thousand miles a year very easily. Um, if you just if you just take the whole like you know the pressure of doing that mileage, think about the the fact that your body's sitting in that same position for all those miles as well, isn't it? You know, <coughs> yeah, and it's just, it's just not something you think of when you're driving that much, but such an impact. How did you how did you cope with the sleep apnea when you were staying away in hotels and things. I mean, I'm assuming you had to take the CPAP machine with you? Yeah. Yes, I used to carry it uh, carry it with me, so that was yet another bag for me to carry around. I was being paid a large, you know, quite a decent salary for carrying bags around the country. That's what it, <laughs> that's what it felt like, <laughs> sometimes. Um, the best paid bag man in the world. That's right, yeah, absolutely. So, um, um, so yeah, now I have my CPAP machine in a, in, a, in a bag which I used to take with me. And just for anyone that's not familiar with that, can you just briefly explain what a CPAP machine is and does? Yes, it's a, it's a, um, uh, I think it's basically a machine that uh, that pumps air into your airway, so it, it artificially splints open your airway. Um, you know, the problem with obstructive sleep apnea is when you sleep, all the muscles relax, <clears throat> and your airway collapses on itself, um, which is what stops you breathing. So, so this I wear a, a sort of a, a nasal mask. Um, and it pumps air into me, um, and uh, that uh, artificially hold, holds open my uh, my airway so that I don't stop breathing. Sounds like um, sounds sounds like it could give some challenges. You know, in particular when you're you know, when you're trying to sleep with someone else. I'm guessing that machine makes noise and stuff too. It does. Yeah, it's not too bad. I, my wife once described me or dis described our um, sleeping arrangement as going to bed with the love child of Darth Vader and an elephant or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> because this, this mask has a long tube <laughs> that goes into the uh, into machine and it does sound very much like you're sort of mm -hmm. a bit Darth Vader-ish as well. <laughs> but bless her, she puts up with it. <laughs> so, the aha moment, the point where you, you know, where you had that you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do something about this. I'm gonna take responsibility. I'm in control. I'm in charge. What was that? What was that? What was the one you know the one moment that one point in time that tipped you over the edge? Um, I don't know whether there was one moment. You know the uh, you know going back to the, to the sort of um, uh, where our stories cross over. Um, my sort of last vision of you was being a lot bigger than you are now. Um, and 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 luckily, um, we kept in touch through social media after I'd left that 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 company. Um, and the, the, what I saw was you drinking strange liquids, doing mad things like exercise and stuff like that, and um, and shrinking before my eyes. Um, so that kind of got me naturally um, inquisitive. Um, and. I think we, we, we sort of, maybe the one pivotal moment was we had a conversation um, and you suggested that I watch a documentary. And I think from that point on, um, I knew that it made sense, um, juicing made sense and that I had to at least give it a try. Um, so maybe it, was that, maybe it was that exchange through Facebook, um, maybe that was the pivotal moment, I don't know. 
I was certainly watching the documentary was, but I, the, the sort of lead up to that and the conversations I had with you were, was was certainly a, certainly a big factor. It well, it's a powerful film, you know. I mean, you you know, you can watch another person for a few years, and you can watch a film for ninety minutes, and that ninety minutes can actually you know be the thing that pushes you over the edge. And I know quite a few people who've been on a similar journey in terms of getting their health back that have said the same thing. I mean. Um, Shane Whaley from Juicing Radio, he talks about how his mum and dad, you know, saw him change through juicing and lifestyle change, and it was only when they saw that same film, Fat Sick and Nearly Dead, that they actually went out and bought a juicer themselves. Yeah, yep. their son, their son changing wasn't enough. Seeing some guy <laughs> they'd never met on a, on TV yeah. for ninety minutes did the yeah. trick, you know. It's bizarre, isn't it? Absolutely bizarre. It's the impact, I think, isn't it? It's hard hitting when you s and people engage with the people who are in these documentaries as well. You start feeling for you know they almost become characters, don't they? So you really want them to 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 improve, and and that's where the impact comes, I think. So yeah. from from that point, um, Mark, where did you start researching? So did you just start following Neil on social media and think, right, I'm going to find out all I can about juicing? Um, no, luckily, uh, as luck would have it, um, Neil launched his website pretty soon after I'd, um, I'd sort of started to explore it. So I had lots of information readily to hand. I didn't have to try too hard. <laughs> um, so, um, no, I mean, uh, Neil's been there right from the very start, really. And, I, I, you know, all his recipes and website have always been a great source of, uh, of, uh, of information for me. And because I'd seen Neil transform himself, I had a, an implicit trust in what he was mm. saying. Um, and I have to say, once I'd actually started juicing for myself as well, I, ha I, I had a rapid um, success you know, in, in those first few weeks, I'd lost a, a shed load of weight um, and, uh, and felt, uh, you know, felt great after, uh, after a couple of weeks. So, you know, I, I'd sort of reinforced that, that trust that I'd had in Neil as well with my own success. Do you know what, just to um, pick up on one thing you said there, um, like, you know, all the diets and all the fads and everything that people have followed for years that we all know don't work, um, it's very rare that you hear people say that they lost weight and they felt great. It's very much, you know, it's a focus of losing weight and there's side effects to it. They feel drained in energy. They feel low. They feel depressed a lot of the time. But that's one consistent through juicing is that people say the weight loss, then the energy gain, which is, is huge, you know, because a lot of people, and myself included, um, juice for that energy boost more than the weight loss, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that's consistent through everyone I think who finds their juicing journey, you know. Yeah, absolutely. That that was certainly my experience. It's, you're supposed to feel miserable when you're on a diet. <laughs> but um, but uh, you know, I, and I did for a couple of days, like lots of other yeah. people. Those initial days, um, they can be quite tough. Um, but I only uh, I only juiced really for um, for about five five days that the first time I tried it. Um, and I lost something like 11 or 14 pounds. I can't remember what it was. And I, I did actually feel great by the end of it. And so mm. it, you can't help but be spurred on, yeah. um, you know, even just, further. Just as a question there, Mark, I mean, saying I was going to clarify. Obviously, having seen Fat Sick and Nearly Dead and seen, you know, two people do 60 days on nothing but juice, the longest you've ever done on juice alone, I think, is about seven days? Yep, seven days. Yep, yep seven days. Yeah. I mean, it... The, the, the thing that was important to me right from the very outset was that um, I had to do something that was sustainable because we, we'd, we've, we've all been there and we've all done traditional diets um, and we've all experienced the sort of, okay, maybe some success, but then the sort of complete reversal of that success when you stop. Um, so I knew that wasn't for me. So th this had to be something that's sustainable. And I know I can't live on juice forever. Um, that isn't sustainable. So I, I, right from the very outset, I had to find something that um, that I could make work. And 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 short periods of juice only to sort of reset your body and reset uh, your mind almost. Um, and then sort of incorporating juicing with healthy eating. Uh, every day or certainly Monday to Friday which was the approach that I took and then relax a little bit at the weekends 
that that seemed to uh, work really well for me, and it's and it's it has been sustainable because I continue to do it now, sort of almost twenty months uh, twenty months later. I love the fact that you said you know you still have those days where you let yourself eat, you know, you relax. You said on the weekends, yeah. because I'm. I'm so against the you know the can't haves the don't the must nots and to give yourself those treats I think is important you know if if you're doing well you've got to reward yourself because that's part of the sustainability of it as well. Yeah, so absolutely. that's great. So what what um, I'm intrigued now, Mark. What is your treat for the weekend? What is your <laughs> your whole you know? Oh, I really have got to eat that right now. Well, what's, you know, what's the guilty pleasure? Yeah. Do you know it? It could be it could be absolutely anything. Um, I I I don't really don't sort of beat myself up or or sort of place restrictions on myself. The um you know so it so it could be fish and chips from the chip shop. If you know if the family are all together and we fancy fish and chips, we're going to have fish and chips. And I'll have mushy peas and I'll have curry sauce and I and you know and I don't worry about it. Um you know the, one of our sort of favourite things to do um, is to have a bit of quality um, family time. And the only real time that we're all together and can get around the table at the same time is is Sunday dinner. So, you know, we will quite often have a roast, a Sunday roast, uh, and and um, you know we're all together around the table, um, and we enjoy that that time uh, together uh, as well. So, you know, it could be anything. You know, I'll have a pizza or I'll go out for a beer and a curry. Um, if, uh, if that's what socially, you know, people are doing that weekend, then uh, then that's all fine. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it, it's almost a shift in mindset that comes alongside with the shift of weight and the change to health. Because it's it's almost as if your mind says, right, I know I can have these things all the time still. You know, you, you must have still had access to all those foods you were eating before. But in your mind, it's kind of switched on a light to say, I choose now not to have those things because I know it's not going to do my body good. So alongside the weight loss, it's, it's that switch on almost of the mind as well, isn't it? It is. It is. It's, it's, um, I, I think that I'm much more aware now. Yeah. I mean, I, I have an insane sweet tooth. Um, I don't think that will ever go away. Um, unfortunately, I also have an insanely good baker for a wife, <laughs> <laughs> which is just you know, trouble's just going to be there, isn't it, around every corner? So, so the temptations are always there, um, and I I do indulge, um, but you know I am much more aware. So I'm I'm aware of the consequences of of, of what I do, whereas before it wouldn't have bothered bothered mm. me at all. I wouldn't have had. Uh, um, you know any qualms about um, you know getting stuck in? Um, I think. Uh, but, but, sorry, sorry, Mark. Sorry, sorry Neil. Carry on. Yeah, no, I was going to say. I, mean, I think there's two things in there really. One is I think it's that shift of what you link pleasure and pain to. Mm. You know, it's that, the, the foods that used to give you pleasure, actually, the consequences of eating them and the pain you associate with how you're going to feel. I mean, you know. From my own experience, some of the foods that I used to think, oh, I can't wait to eat that, I love that. Now, I, if I eat it, which, you know, because I'm similar, there's nothing that I'm like, I, I can't eat it. You know, if I want to eat it, I eat it. But some of the stuff where I'd be like, you know, I used to get so excited, now I eat it, and afterwards I'm like, I feel like crap. Mm. Yeah. I, you know, what, why, did, why did I eat that? Because whilst I quite enjoyed the flavor of it, within, you know, within, a, within an hour or less, I can feel the difference in my body, and it's not, and it's not a good feeling, you know. Um, so for me, I think part of it's it, part of it is that sort of shift in what's pleasurable and what's painful in terms of what I, I suppose it's almost what our priorities are. And I'm more concerned about feeling well than I am about having something that tastes good in my mouth if I know I'm going to feel crap afterwards. Yeah, I think it's like you know, if you break it down to like a cellular level as well. Once your cells have got all that goodness in there, as soon as you you know them plow in the rubbish again, the reaction to that is going to be more extreme, isn't it? You know, you they as the cells have felt the energy that you can get from food. So to to go back to eating the rubbish is um you know they're going to feel it as well. So yeah. it's just a complete change, isn't it? Throughout, I think mind, body, and everything, and mindset. 
Yeah, completely. And I mean, the other thing I was going to say is you mentioned mindfulness and stuff in there a couple of times, Mark. I've, I've read numerous things that talk about the amount of decisions we make in a day about food. Um, and the, the sort of headline statistic, when, when most people read it or hear it, they're like, that can't be right. Because the headline statistic is that we make 227 decisions a day. The average person makes 227 decisions a day about food. And you think, I don't make that many. And if you read the rest of the research, it says 95% of them are unconscious. Which then you think, actually, 5% of that, yeah, probably I do make, mm -hmm. you know, that you know, 10 to 15 kind of decisions a day about food. That probably is what I'm aware of making. Mm -hmm. And I think your point about mindfulness, Mark, is a really important one because when you start to focus more on your health and you make your health more of a priority than food just tasting good, you probably become more aware of those subconscious decisions about what you're going to eat and that shapes your behaviours and your habits around it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that's... Um, I, I, and also, um, it's the, the sort of the impact that that has on people around you as well. I think if if one person's being sort of a bit more conscious about what they're doing, um, those that are close to you and that are around you can't help but be a bit more conscious about what they're doing as well. Um, it does have a sort of a knock-on effect, um, which is great because uh, we're a sort of, uh, you know, most of us are all juicers in our family now. It's a bit of a pain for me because I have to make gallons of the stuff and I'm the one that has to make it. But, um, but you know, everybody's benefiting, so I, I can't complain really. It, it's great though, isn't it? That ripple effect. You know, mm -hmm. when you when you see the the changes you make in yourself, inspiring other people. I mean, it's it it's one of the things that you know. I, I love when we talk like this, Mark, because it's always a really good reminder to me of the ripple effect of my own story. Because you know, when, when I started focusing on my health, it wasn't about trying to help other people. It was about trying to help me and trying to be there for my family. And yeah, you know, I can't remember who it was that first said this, but I read again. I read something or heard something that said, you know, everybody's life is either an example or a warning. And I think I used to be a warning, and now I try to be an example. And when you know, whenever we talk, and you, you know, and it's me having posted stupid green juices on Facebook and stuff that was part of your story. And then I hear of how your stories inspired so many other people. And you know, I mean, you've got how many thousand followers on Twitter now? Uh, ten and a half thousand. Would yeah, you believe? You know, since you've got ten and a half thousand people seeing what you're doing and being inspired by what you do, and I think you know, the more that all of us can do to kind of empower ourselves and then ripple that out to empower other people, you know, it, it is that thing of you know the the be the change you want to see in the world thing. You know, you've got to mm -hmm. you've got to work on yourself first and then let that thing spread out to everybody else. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. So. With the like inspiring other people, there, Mark. So once you kind of felt you had to share what you'd learnt with everyone else, um, what was you, where were you going with that? You know, was it literally I'm going to share my juice and journey and put it out there, or did you have an intention at that point of of what you wanted to achieve? Um, I just I just think that. My own thought process process was this is just so amazing. I just can't help but not shout it from the rooftops. <laughs> I think it was something like that, and I think I think it's something that a lot of people that sort of um, experience some sort of uh, some sort of success with juicing, we all kind of feel a, a bit like that. I think you just want to you want to shout to everybody that's prepared to listen how amazing mm -hmm. it is. Um, not everybody's prepared to listen, I have to say. So that's a that's a little lesson that you have to sort of learn a, along the way as well. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I, th there was no real in, uh, sort of real intention other than to sort of just make it uh, sort of available. You know, mm -hmm. just get the, get the word out. I think it was, uh, yeah. there was there was nothing more to them than that. And if you had to summarise the results that you've had since you made these changes. You know, how what, what, how would you describe the the impact that the lifestyle changes you took have had oh. on, had on your life in general? Not even obviously the weight would be part of it, but not even just the weight. Just a, a general what's you know what's the difference it's made to your life? It's it's just made a complete difference. Um, 
absolutely. I'm, I'm, I, I shudder to think how close I was to the, to the edge of a cliff in terms of, of health. So that, that, that's the biggest thing. Um, I'm, I'm not taking any medication. Um, I'm seeing improvements in my obstructive sleep apnea, so I'm working on that. Um, I've lost six stone, uh, medication free. Um, I am fitter than I probably have ever been in the last sort of, uh, I don't know, 15 to 20 years. I've taken up cycling uh, just recently and I've been absolutely amazed by how much progress I've made in quite a short distance with, with my cycling. And also, the, the, the rate of recovery. So usually, if I did anything as strenuous as even walking up the stairs, for a couple of days afterwards, you might feel it in the legs. <laughs> um, now I can go on a 50-mile cycle ride, and I can feel the legs stiffen up that afternoon, but the next day, they're absolutely fine. Um, and the, the, that's just astounding to me, how, how quickly, if, you, if your body's in a good, good state of health, how quickly it can recover. Um, so, you know, it, my life is completely different. I have way more energy than I ever expected to have. Um, uh, my health has improved dramatically. I think I have a, a better relationship with uh, with my wife and my kids as a result. Um, I've learned how to use Twitter <laughs> <laughs> and, and sort of playing with social media, um, and it's great. You know, the the I have a whole whole new outlook on uh, on life. Um, amazing. Did you start um, any exercise alongside, like early on, Mark? Or was it literally, you know, you changed in the health and now you're finding the fun in the exercise side? I, I did very little. Um, I hate going to the gym. I would, I would never, I've never joined a gym. Um, so we were doing sort of little bits of walking and I found that um, actually as my energy levels increased, you, you can't really stop yourself from wanting mm. to do a bit more exercise. Um, but I never did anything um, terribly serious. Um, so it's only really sort of, I, I will say that last year was the year of, uh, of um, sort of losing, um, a, you know, a good chunk of my weight. Um, you know, that's still work in progress as well. Um, and this year is the year that I'm going to sort of take it to the next level and, and get sort of a much fitter. And, uh, and cycling seems to be the, the thing that I enjoy to do, you know, enjoy doing most um, uh, on the fitness side. So, but no, very, very, very little. I'm ashamed to say, very little exercise really when I in when I started juicing. Okay. You've been making some great progress on the cycling as well. I mean, you know, again, obviously because we we're, we're personal friends, I see some of your posts and stuff on Facebook, and some of the ones from your wife and whatever, and it's like, it, it's just so cool to read. It's just so, you know, just because like you say, it, it's happened so quickly in terms of. You know, you bought your bike, and well, it's, it's only weeks, isn't it, that you've gone from mm -hmm. not having really ridden a bike for years to going out and doing 50 miles. Yeah, I, I don't think I've I've ridden a bike since I was probably I don't know 13 or 14. Um, so I've I've had this bike a couple of months now, um, and the weather wasn't that great. So I'm a, I, I've sort of started off being a bit of a fair weather cyclist. <laughs> I've been there. Don't knock yourself, Mark. <laughs> no, that's right. But now the weather's uh, improved. Um, it's great. I, I, I love it. I, I get out at sort of half six in the morning on a Saturday or Sunday morning so it doesn't disrupt the, uh, the day too much. Um, and uh, I have a great time. Just out in nature, um, you know, dodging cars. So, you, <laughs> so you've become a mammal, yeah? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I'm, I've... Uh, I, I did have a few photographs taken of me, which I've sort of destroyed of me in my full lycra gear. But uh, maybe some of them will sort of pop up on social media at some point. Who knows? Yeah, yeah the, I'm looking forward to seeing the Twitter tags with middle-aged man in lycra written at the end of them. It'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So one of the, um, one of the things, uh, Mark, that we like to do on these sessions is to ask you... Um, to share with us a, a motivational quote that inspires you and why. Right, okay. Well, the, the one that I most often use on social media and when I'm having a bit of a, a stern chat to myself is, a, is actually a quote from, um, from Winston Churchill. Um, and it's, 
it goes like this: um, success is going from failure to failure without um, without a loss of enthusiasm, which I interpret as never giving up. So, with any endeavour, you're going to hit hurdles. Um, it's not going to quite go according to plan, but if you can keep positive and keep going, um, you'll you'll get the the success that you're looking for. Um, and I kind of it's nice and simple, and uh, and and it's always the one that I'll uh, that I'll use to try and encourage other people as well. It, it's okay to be a perceived failure, which of course you're not, because as long as you keep going, um, how can you have failed at anything? Um, so uh, I love that quote, and I, I use it all the time. It's cool. It's cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a big believer that there's no such thing as failure if you learn. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's only failure if you don't learn a lesson from it. If you learn a lesson from it, then it's absolutely not failure because it's, in fact, it's, you know, it might not be the success you anticipated, but it's a different kind of success because you've got something from it that's benefited you and will help you next time. Yeah, absolutely. I think if you haven't failed in something, what interesting stories have you got to tell? You know, most of the most successful people on you know on this planet have, have failed, and it's not about failing. It's just about trying something, and they're not being right at the time, or not being right for them. So that's an yeah cracking quote. Well, imagine to be honest, imagine going to the cinema, <coughs> and there was no failure in the film. You know how boring would that be? <laughs> yeah. Go go to yeah go and go and see. Uh, um, what's the last film I saw in the cinema? It was probably the new Fast and Furious film, you know. Just imagine if you went and saw that, and you know, in the opening scene, they got the bad guy. Yeah, he just drives down the road in the car and catches the guy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and then and then you watch them for the next, you know, seventy-five minutes go out <laughs> to celebrate or something. It just wouldn't be quite the same, it would. would it? Not you know, at all. You know, those engaging, it's like you said, Sue. You know, those engaging stories. They mm -hmm. go up and then they dip and then they go up again and then you think, yeah, this is it. They've done it and then it falls off the cliff and then yeah. it has to find its way back up. And I, I think that's life. And I think that's why, you know, I think that's why those films and stuff actually you know, draw us into the film so much, is for the very reason that yeah. that's what our lives are like. Absolutely. So. Mark, what what are you seeing from your kind of following that you're getting now in in the juicing? You know, what journeys are people telling you that they're having? Um, again, it's uh, everywhere you turn. Really, there's um, the, the, there seems to be sort of uh, amazing stories um, from from people in in all walks of uh, of life. Um, you know, and 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 also, you know. There's there's some real struggles as well. So you, you, you can see people that, that, that take to juicing and, and seem to find success very easily. Um, and some people that, that struggle with it but persist anyway. Um, you know, it's the, there is the, there's such a sort of um, it's like the floodgates have been opened certainly in the last sort of um, I don't know, twelve months or so. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in the UK especially, where juice bars are popping up left, right and centre. Um, you know, there are new sort of outlets through social media for, for people to sort of um, promote their juicing businesses and, and their successes. Um, it's unbelievable, really, and, and I, I, I hope that uh, you know at, so, at some point the, uh, the, uh, the the medical profession will sort of uh, sit up and take a, a little bit more notice. Mm -hmm. I, I think you know, with the floodgates of success that are that's happening at the moment, it would be. Um, it would be terrible if they didn't, um, because I think so much can be achieved by just um, doing something so so simple. Yeah, I think I think they are. You know, they're seeing the change. I think um, certain GPs. You know, they are. They, you can't ignore it because people's health is improving. And I, you, something you just said then actually made me think. Juicing could never really be described as a fad or diet as such because whenever did you see a cabbage soup bar pop up, you know, <laughs> or a maple syrup bar pop up? It just didn't happen. That's fads. Juicing yeah. is a sustained way of changing your, your health through yeah. eating more fruit. The Atkins restaurant. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 rest, the restaurant where you can only eat meat fried in lard. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sadly, there's actually a lot of those. They just don't call themselves that. Yeah, <laughs> even where you're branding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, completely. Well, it's like that. Um, have you have you heard of the Heart Attack Grill in the US? Oh yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So you know, all of the all of the um, waiting staff dress up as if they're sort of medical professionals, and mm. they put like a surgical gown on you as a as a bib when you eat. And I think if you're over, I can't remember what the weight is now, but if you're over a certain weight, you eat for free. It's, it's shocking. Yeah, it's shocking, isn't it? It's, it is crazy. But no, I mean, I think you know the the rise of kind of healthy food. It is just a fantastic thing, and I think mm. actually, you know, there's a few people that probably should be heralded on this, and certainly here in the UK, one of the big ones got to be Jamie Oliver. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's interesting, Jamie Oliver. I was reading something in the press literally today, um, and it had been shared by a, a vegan Facebook page, and it said the vegan police won't like this, but I think it's fantastic. Jamie Oliver has just announced that he's he goes vegetarian three days a week. Mm. Although, I mean, if you follow his journey, um, you know his his branding as such as as a chef has changed phenomenally over the last two three years. You know, going back three years ago, he was not branding himself as you know anything as healthy as such. But he was he's always been about good home cooked food. Doesn't it? You know, nothing processed, nothing added in. It's just using good food in a simple way. And I think that, yeah, you're right, Neil. People have, have started buying into that process of like, it's not difficult to make healthy food. You know, you can make something healthy as quick as you can. You can bung something in the oven. And I think it's only over the last six months to a year that people are thinking, actually, that's true. Yeah. You no, know, yeah, it's not that quick. The only the only time I've been kind of um, I suppose caught out on that is one of one of my courses recently. I was talking about you know juicing as an example. I don't think you can cook a meal as quickly as you can make a juice and wash the juicer. And there was somebody who was sat at the back of one of my courses who said that's not true. He said you know when the advert break comes on, I can go to the kitchen, I can cook myself a meal and it's gone ping before the program starts <laughs> again and there is no washing up <laughs> and, I, and I couldn't argue with that but you know but the reality is putting aside the kind of the TV dinner mm -hmm. then actually healthy food doesn't take any longer and I think you know, the, the more people learn about kind of the what happens with the processing of food and the impact that has on your health and, and all of those kinds of things, the more people are taking control of it themselves. And I think, yeah, ultimately, the, the real lesson is that education is the way you change things. You know, edu educate people on how to do things for themselves and you change the world. Change things for them and it's, mm. a, and it's a temporary thing. I think the beauty is what we said earlier, though, about the ripple effect because it's not... I, I'm not seeing these people around me change and then thinking, yeah, great, I've changed. You know, that it's instinct to then help other people and help other people learn. And that's that's the amazement in it for me, is like seeing it spread out. You know, and, and that's just human goodness, I think. I think that's in all of us. Yeah, no, you know? absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think just just to, again, just to add something on that, in terms of that, in terms of that ripple effect, that ripple effect with education, with everything else, if we're talking about kind of motivational quotes and things, I mean, I'm a huge fan of many of the words that came from Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. And there was one of his quotes, he said, it's not the kings and generals that make history, it's the masses of the people. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, the more people, the more ordinary people you know it, it doesn't need a it doesn't need a celebrity on TV it doesn't need a politician it doesn't need you know a head of state or a royal family member or something to do this stuff it needs one person that their friends and family say he could never do it mm -hmm. do it and then they look and say hang on if he can do it I can do it you know it, it it's, it's like with me you know most of my friends that knew the old Neil if they'd seen, the, you know, if they'd been told in advance the journey I was going to go on, they said, nah, not him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Never going to happen. And I'd have said the same thing myself, you know. At the beginning, I had no idea how this was going to turn out. Um, 
and I mean, you know, Mark, actually, you're a good testament to that. I can remember sitting with you in a restaurant in Basingstoke and you taking pictures of the food I was ordering and basically saying, this ain't going to last. <laughs> Confidence. <laughs> That's right. Supportive friends, that's what you need. Yeah, well, it was so it was it was kind of so out of character that that was the yeah. thing. Yeah. And um, so uh, yes, there were there were several of those meals and several photographs I seem to recall. Yeah, yeah, but but you know, ordering bottles of water instead of beer, and you know, asking for the dressing to come in a jug rather than being all over the food and stuff like that. You know, it's, it it was it felt really abnormal for me when I started doing those kinds of things. But very quickly, it became a habit, and I think I, I think one of the really, for me at least, I think one of the really big things is the habits we form shape who we become. Mm. It's interesting, as you nearly said that, because I I think everyone struggles at the start, you know, with that social element. But I think personally, you get to a stage where you realise what's at value, so you think it doesn't matter what anyone else is saying. You know, this is the change I'm feeling in myself, so you know, as many people can take the mic and laugh, it really, it doesn't matter, because you know the difference it's making. Yeah, uh, yeah, if, you, if you're strong on why you're doing something, yeah, yeah, you know, not even what you're doing, but why you're doing it, then you find, you know, you keep going until you find a way that works, yeah. and it might not be the first approach you take, you know, and I mean, we've talked a lot about juicing on this, and Juicing might not be the thing for everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it might be something that you go, ah, I can't stand this green stuff. I'd rather eat it. Well, fine, eat it. You know, it it doesn't have to be about green juice in a glass. It's just about finding finding what's important to you and then finding a way of making it happen. Yeah, absolutely. I see so many people come from different directions. Like some people are kind of waking up through the exercise route. You know, they're finding a passion, like you said, Mark. You know, they really find a passion like cycling. And then that kick starts their diet on a reverse. Some people are coming through the diet route and are fed up with doing all the diets out there. So they're just following good, healthy food. And you're right, it, everyone's kind of converging to this point of, I think, of getting their bodies healthier from so many interesting routes. And that's amazing, though, because we've all got a different story then. You know, if we all came down the juicing route, yeah. we're all singing the same story in a way, you know, apart from our past. So it, it is great. Um, I think it's exponential. You know, people are just going to continue to come out of the woodwork and step up. And I think it's about us all stepping up, really, and taking ownership for our own health, but also that we're all on this planet together and taking ownership to help as many people as you can. Yeah, it's, it's, it's about setting a standard of what's acceptable, isn't it? Hmm. You know, it's about your new norm. And when you find your new yeah. norm, yeah. the old you is not acceptable anymore. Yeah. Like, do you know what? I can't believe I used to live like that. I'm never, ever, ever going back there. Yeah. And once you once you reach that point of, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not perfect. I'm not somebody who can sit here and say, you know, I never have bad days or, you know, I never miss a run or I never mm -hmm. eat crap. You know, that's that's back to that being sustainable thing. And, and life is a journey and we're all on it. And it's just about enjoying the, the journey. It's not about the destination. It's about enjoying the, you know, it's about in, when I did my 100-mile run last year, there was somebody that said to me um, on the run-up to it, if you're not enjoying the if you're not enjoying the view, you're running too fast. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a good metaphor for life. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, Mark, the other the other sort of big question is, if you could pick one song to be the soundtrack of your life, what is it and why? <clears throat> right. Okay. I had to think long and hard about this, um, and I've gone sort of completely. Um, uh, out of the ordinary, because I guess you would expect me to pick a well-known classic that somebody would, uh, everybody would identify with, but I haven't. <laughs> so I've I've actually um, gone with a song that um, is was only released last month on an album um, by a band called Hailstorm. So I'm I'm really sort of into my rock music. <clears throat> so I guess. Um, Maybe uh, people from the States will have heard of Hailstorm and some people from the UK, but um, but, but not too many. Um, and the song that I chose was a song called I Am The Fire, which I think the song is about um, having the sort of um, empowering yourself to escape a, a bad relationship, but the actual words of the song can be 
can be used in conjunction with it, with any situation whereby you're you're sort of empowering yourself, and it, it's it's really about sort of um, having those sort of doubts, but actually realizing that the the person that you're waiting for to help you out of the situation or to help you into a situation is yourself, um, and this song just sort of really sort of. Uh, uh, resonated with me for whatever reason. I mean, we saw it live actually before I'd heard it on the album because we went to see the band uh, live um, before the album was released and that was the standout song of the evening and when it was on the album it, I just thought it was brilliant. So Hailstorm, I Am The Fire, go and check it out. It's a good rock track. Do you know, I've, I've never heard that song but I am, as soon as we finished I am going to be like putting it into <laughs> Google and finding it on you. I mean, I'm assuming it is on YouTube or something, right? Has it got a video? Uh, yeah, actually, I think that probably the one that will pop up in the uh, in the search engine first is the gig, uh, the live rendition of that song at the gig that we uh, that we actually went to at Wolverhampton. Um, so listen to the words. It's good. Fantastic. I'll check it out. Anything you want to add, Sue? Um, I don't think so, no. Uh, just a great story and just keep doing what you're doing, um, Mark. Keep inspiring other people, really. It's just really been good to hear your story. I appreciate that. Thank you, Sue. And do you know what? No matter how many times I hear your story and, you know, I have watched it evolve, I still love hearing it time and time again. So, you know, I, I we, we've done a few interviews together. I'm sure we'll do a few more. <laughs> You're such a charmer, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I'm just... it's so it's so inspiring what you've done, mate. And you know, to again to see that ripple effect and see the people. I mean, you know, something we haven't mentioned here, but I know, and I think you know. I hope you don't mind me mentioning is you. Know, you've got your dad juicing, right? Yeah. You know, and you've got you know a whole multitude of friends and family and things juicing and yeah. it is to me all of this is about that ripple and I've got to be honest the only thing for me with juicing now is I don't like the word juicing anymore mm. and the only reason I don't like the word juicing anymore is people seem to think of juicing as you're living on juice only mm. as yeah. opposed to you've bought a juicer and you're incorporating it into your lifestyle and so I'm going off the word juicing because I think it's got mixed meanings and the meaning that a lot of people will put on it isn't necessarily the one that we mean when we're talking about it you know you didn't get your dad to go out and buy a juicer and then live on nothing but juice for the rest of his days you did get him to start juicing you did get lots of friends and family to start incorporating juicing as part of their lifestyles right that's I'm, I'm correct with my understanding there yeah yeah absolutely yeah absolutely I mean I think it's probably because um, maybe it's helped that I've never done any sort of prolonged juice only periods myself. So people have seen that, that I've taken a sort of slightly different approach from what's portrayed in the media. Um, and maybe that's helped with people that are sort of um, are close to me. And to be fair, you know, people get some fantastic results from that. I'm not, you know, when, I don't think any of us are saying it shouldn't be done, but it's not the only way. Exactly. I think for for some people it's absolutely necessary. You know, um, people can benefit greatly from um, uh, from sort of prolonged uh, juice only periods. But um, but for me, it, it wasn't the right way, and we all have to find what's right for us. I think. Absolutely, and yeah, I think and I, and I think that's a really important message to end on. Yeah. You know, we all have to find what's right for us. Um, you found what's right for you and, and keep doing what you're doing and hopefully you know anyone that's watching this has either found what's right for them or they're getting close to finding it and I'm sure your your story will have helped inspire them to uh, to go out and you know really nail that thing down and make it happen I, I hope so I hope so all we can do is is just spread spread the juicy word <laughs> uh, some people will pick up on it I'm sure but uh, no, I appreciate you asking me to share my story. I really do. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks for your time.